Next on Eyewitness News, toll takers on the Garden State Parkway authorize a strike. Will we have a traffic nightmare this holiday weekend? Former Brooklyn DA Liz Holtzman is held up at gunpoint. And a special report on the coolest employers next. This is the Tri-State Area's news leader, Channel 7 Eyewitness News, with Bill Butel, Diana Williams, Scott Clark with sports, Sam Champion with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast, and the Eyewitness News team. Now, Eyewitness News. Good evening, I'm Bill Butel. Sarah Wallace is with me tonight, sitting in for Diana Williams. Brooklyn's former district attorney, Elizabeth Holtzman, probably knows a little bit more right now about crime than she used to. She was a victim tonight, held up at gunpoint in Manhattan by two men. One of the two men is still at large, but the other man was chased down by firefighters. Celeste Ford is live now at their fire station in Midtown with details. Good evening, Celeste. Good evening, Bill. Within the hour, a very grateful Elizabeth Holtzman came right here to Engine Company Number 1 to personally thank her heroes. Two firefighters helped the former Congresswoman tonight after she was robbed at gunpoint of $70. Thanks to those two firefighters, one of the two suspects was caught. Holtzman, a grand dame of city politics, escaped unharmed. Shortly after 10, Elizabeth Holtzman strode into the firehouse on West 31st Street to shake the hands of two brave firefighters, Stephen Wojciechowski and John Montani. They came to her rescue after a harrowing ordeal. They risked their lives. They knew these guys had guns, but they didn't fear for their lives. They went and they ran after them, and uh, the police department came, and they knew they had guns, and they risked their lives. So. We ought to be grateful. It happened shortly after 7 at a bank on the corner of Park Avenue South and 28th Street. 54-year-old Holtzman, a Democratic powerhouse, was depositing money at an ATM when two men armed with a gun attempted to rob the former district attorney. Holtzman screamed for help. The robbers ran, and so did she, right into the firefighters. They were responding to an unrelated call a block away. She looked very frightened. She was pointing, and she said, I just got robbed in the ATM. So and what did you do? Uh, well, she says, I, I think they're still in the area. So we walked around the corner with her, and the two suspects were still there with their backs to us. The firefighters gave chase and were soon joined by police. They caught the guy with a gun, but his accomplice got away. It happened to be her who was, a, you know, a, a visible person in the city. But, you know, it's, things like this happen, you know, to a lot of other people, too. So. How are you doing? Well, I feel much better now. <laughs> I was a little shaken afterwards, but uh, I was really very grateful. Tonight, Holtzman says she was staring down a 357 Magnum, and once again, she proved to be a scrappy survivor. We're live on the west side, Celeste Ford, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. In New Jersey tonight, there is labor trouble as the holiday weekend begins. The people who collect tolls on the Garden State Parkway voted tonight to strike when their contract expires in about an hour. And a strike threat hangs over the New Jersey Turnpike. Jim Dolan is live at the Parkway's booth in Asbury Park. Jim? Yes, sir. They're not going to strike just yet, and workers don't like to use the term slowdown. It is, after all, so unpleasant. But face it, with toll collectors working without a contract and trying to make a point, Commuters can expect this weekend a long and polite greeting at the plaza, directions to their destination at the plaza, the sort of kindness that can cause long delays. Traffic moves smoothly through the tolls in the Garden State Parkway tonight, but stick around. If the toll plazas are a bottleneck normally, angry workers are likely this weekend to put a cork in the bottle though they can't be too specific about exactly how. It's coming from Trent, it's coming from Governor Whitman. We know that, and we won't stand for it. What are you gonna do? We're gonna do whatever we have to do to wake her up. And whatever it takes, we'll do. And just like I said, whatever we gotta do, we will do. Translation? Well, if you've complained about rude toll collectors in the past, you won't this weekend. They'll be so polite on the parkway, they'll kill you with kindness. If anything, we'd ask them to be courteous to a patron and talk to them. Ask them that, tell them to have a nice day, you know, directions, that's... You multiply that by the 3.2 million people who are out there traveling, and that's going to take a lot well, of time. Sure it will, but if someone wants to know how to get to a certain place and we want to see how their day is, so there's nothing wrong with that. The dispute is over wages and benefits. Management claiming a $100 million deficit is forcing cutbacks. Turnpike workers, by the way, deny plans for a slowdown. Watch this exchange between management and union at a press conference today. There have been instances of 
slowdowns on the that's turnpike. That's a lie. You know that's a lie. Mr. Force, if you're gonna, if you want to sit and listen, listen. No, you're not going to just sit and listen to lies. Hey, now tell us where there was a slowdown. The plan for the weekend is to have part-time and administrative workers standing by just in case there's a problem. They will eliminate the toll on the turnpike altogether if necessary until backup workers can get control of the situation and they'll have state police standing by. We expect that the contract period uh, will end tonight at midnight uh, without a new contract and uh, we hope to continue beyond that but we don't have any schedule right now. Yeah, the contract for the Parkway workers is up at midnight tonight. For the Turnpike workers, it is up on Sunday. You can expect the two unions to work in unison, so when lines start forming here on the Parkway, you can expect them to start forming on the Turnpike, too. Happy motoring this weekend. Reporting live from Asbury Park, Jim Dolan, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Happy motoring indeed. Thank you, Jim. Mayor Giuliani asked them not to strike over the holiday weekend. So it is that the workers who keep New York City's hotels up and running have put their strike plans on hold till after the 4th of July holiday. So union workers at the Plaza Hotel and other well-known hotels in Manhattan and elsewhere will remain on the job through the weekend. Negotiators are meeting again tomorrow. The union says it wants a wage increase and more job security. There is not anything like enough security to prevent piracy of movies on video. Tonight, thousands of pirated tapes, including the new Disney movie Pocahontas, were seized in the Bronx. Four people arrested. Police and investigators from the movie industry say more than 5,000 tapes were seized, along with more than 100 VCRs that were used, of course, for copying from the original. We know more tonight about the Unabomber's demand to the Washington Post and the New York Times. He wants the papers to publish a 35,000-word essay and three annual follow-ups, and they're now faced with an ethical dilemma whether to agree. The document's themes include complaints about computer science, social change, and a breakdown of values. If the papers publish it, the Unabomber promises to stop his deadly mail bomb attacks. A rabid raccoon attack came without any warning and in the victim's backyard. Beth Rosenberg was just taking her pup Spanky out of her home in Wyckoff, New Jersey when it happened. The raccoon scratched and may have bitten Rosenberg above her ankle. Spanky wasn't hurt, but Rosenberg had to go to the hospital to get rabies shots. Raccoons go into my garbage. Um, we see the raccoons running around, but never a rabbit raccoon. Never even thought at 7 o'clock in the morning to, to check. Now I do. Bergen County health officials say this is the first confirmed rabid raccoon in the area this year. Bill. There is confirmation tonight of a meeting of the minds, a meeting of the minds that means millions of dollars in savings for the New York City budget. Mayor Rudy Giuliani tonight announced the city has reached an agreement with its municipal workers that will help balance the city's budget of more than $31 billion. The arrangement is expected to save New York City something on the order of $600 million in labor costs. The plan calls for as many as 9,000 city workers to be cut from the payrolls through early retirement and attrition. Still ahead, the evidence mounts against O.J. Coming up, how an FBI agent tried to link Simpson to the murders. Will one of the biggest stars make up with his supermodel girlfriend after being busted with a hooker? And are you looking for a cool, creative job that gives you more than just a paycheck? A special report on the 25 coolest companies coming up a little later. A four-day recess begins tonight in the O.J. Simpson case. Plenty of time for the jury to digest the latest hair evidence. Prosecutor Marcia Clark used expert testimony and hair samples to try to link O.J. Simpson to the murder scene. Jada Dapper has more on today's riveting testimony. After a week of sometimes mind-numbing testimony about hairs and fibers, the prosecution this morning finally got down to brass tacks. Whose hair was found where? How many hairs did you actually find on the Rockingham glove that exhibited the same microscopic characteristics as the hairs of Nicole Brown? I believe there were four that were recovered from that item. Uh, Using electron yeah. microscope photos of known hairs from the victims and comparing them with hairs found on the glove discovered at Simpson's estate, FBI expert Doug Diedrich presented compelling evidence. Nicole's hair, most of it ripped from her head, and Ron Goldman's hair, also pulled from his scalp, were both found on the Rockingham glove. Well, it, it's clear to me, based on what I see and what I know about the significance of hair examinations, that that glove was there at the crime scene. But even more damaging for O.J., his hair, picked from the blue knit ski cap, found in the Bundy walkway. How many overall head hairs did you find that exhibited the same microscopic characteristics in that cap as the defendant's hair? Well, there were 12, 12 hairs. 
12 hairs inside and out, all consistent with those of O.J. Simpson. But Marsha Clark, hoping to leave the jury with something to think about during their four-day weekend, save the best for last, a hair found on Ron Goldman's shirt that was, again, just like O.J.'s. Would you expect to find hairs from an attacker on clothing of the victim if there was no bodily physical contact between them? Jack and I for a sidebar. Oh, well. I wouldn't expect to find anything if there was no physical contact. Out of the presence of the jury, Judge Ito asked the prosecution about their request for yet another jury field trip. This time they want to do it at night and they only want to go to the crime scene. The defense said if there's going to be another field trip, they want to go back to OJ's house. The judge said he'd make the decision on Wednesday. In Los Angeles, J.D. Dapper, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Some people like to watch TV movies and talk shows that are, according to the law, considered to be indecent. Now the hours for watching those programs are being reduced. Instead of starting at 8 p.m., a federal court ruled today that racy programs on broadcast television cannot be shown until 10 p.m. Indecency includes offensive talk about sex or bodily functions, and unlike obscenity, indecency is protected by the First Amendment. The actor Hugh Grant is trying to make up for his indecency. He's back in England tonight for a reunion with his girlfriend. Grant was arrested, you'll remember, in Los Angeles earlier this week for having sex with a prostitute. That did not go over big with his girlfriend, supermodel Elizabeth Hurley. They've been talking at a country retreat outside London, but we do not know if they have or have not reconciled. The remarkable career of singer and actress Lana Turner is remembered tonight. The glamorous star of more than 50 films died last evening after a long battle with throat cancer. Nicknamed the Sweater Girl, she brought sizzle to the screen, particularly when paired with leading men such as John Garfield in The Postman Always Rings Twice. <laughs> Seven times married, one of her love affairs ended in sensational headlines when her daughter stabbed to death Turner's abusive mobster boyfriend. Lana Turner was 75. A sad note hit the music world today. R&B singer Phyllis Hyman was found dead in her apartment this afternoon. Hyman, who was 45, was scheduled to appear at the Apollo Theater tonight. She made a name for herself as a Motown great and a jazz singer. Police say she apparently committed suicide. Still ahead, are you tired of your job? Our special report focuses on the 25 coolest companies that will take you as far as your imagination allows. And imagine a treatment for migraine headaches that could be on the horizon for millions of Americans. How would you like a new job? Better still, how would you like to create your own job? If you have a taste for high technology and a clever idea for using it, you just might land among what Fortune magazine calls the coolest companies. In tonight's special report, Diana Williams tells us what it takes to make a cool company. Uh, here we go. Adam Curry looks too cool to be a computer nerd, but he admits computers are his first love. That's why the former VJ traded in his MTV for cyberspace. I've always liked technology, and, uh, you know, just the, the MTV got in the way for a couple of years. <laughs> Curry's company is called OnRamp. Less than two years old, OnRamp brings special events to the Internet, like the NFL draft pick. During the NBA Finals, basketball star Dominique Wilkins went online with OnRamp to answer questions from fans. Curry also produced a cybercast from the Grammys, with backing from hip advertisers like Reebok. We had Tony Bennett, we spoke to him, um, uh, Gray, uh, David Crosby. Um, here you can see, this is something people rarely ever see, the place markers uh, in the shrine so the cameras know if boys to men win, that's where they're going to be. All of this makes Curry's company cool, cool enough to make Fortune magazine's list of 25 cool companies. All of Fortune's cool companies are involved in technologies that most of us really don't understand. The companies are young, so are the entrepreneurs that run them, and none of them are close to making Fortune's top 500 list. Pacific Microsonics is on Fortune's list. They're enhancing the music we listen to by perfecting digital audio. We're just simply taking what's on the tape and, and making it be exactly as it is. There's also Digital Domain, a company whose special effects have impressed Hollywood. Get ready for a little chump. So you've got um, CD-ROM companies, you've got companies making spreadsheets for Wall Street. Um, you've got the 
people doing special effects for the movies. So a lot of um, basically anything that we can use that comes out of technologies that we can't understand. But while we may not understand how it works, these cool companies do, and they have a lot in common. At most, the dress is jeans and t-shirts. There aren't a lot of employees, but the devotion to a project is intense. Adam Curry, once devoted to music and MTV, is now hooked on Cybercast. His next project will take him to a really cool place, the North Pole. Exciting stuff for a computer geek, but Adam Curry says he has big plans. Um, my vision is, you know, let me be Ted Turner of cyberspace, you know, with a cuter wife. In Midtown, Diana Williams, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. A breakthrough tonight in research on migraine headaches. Scientists think they have found the cause. Research at Montefiore Hospital shows that migraines may be caused in the brainstem. A drug known as sumatriptan is effective in about 80% of the cases. Other research may have found the cause of persistent bedwetting. Scientists at the University of Copenhagen say the problem among children is genetic, passed from generation to generation through a single gene, and they say their discovery could lead to treatment. Scott Clark is up next with sports. Tonight, the NBA decides to lock out players. And in baseball, Eddie Murray goes for his 3,000th hit. All this while the Red Hot Yanks try to win on the road. We'll have highlights coming up. But first, here are tonight's winning New York lottery numbers, which were drawn earlier this evening. And for those of you holding New Jersey tickets, here are your winning numbers. And now we go live to tonight's Take 5 drawing. It's New York Lottery's Take 5 drawing, observed by an auditor from KPMG, Pete Barwick. Good evening and welcome to New York Lottery's Take 5 drawing for today, Friday, June 30th, 1995. Where players can win cash prizes by matching 5, 4, or 3 numbers. Or a free bonus ticket by matching just 2 numbers. Now for tonight's Take 5 numbers. The first winning number is 32. Tonight's second winning number is 33. The third winning number is 4. Tonight's fourth winning number is 28. And the fifth winning Take 5 number is 22. Tonight's winning Take 5 numbers are 32, 33, 4, 28, and 22. For the New York Lottery, I'm Stephanie Moore. Thank you and have a good night. The Cleveland Indians, one of them, walks away with another piece of a record tonight. Scott Clark. Bill, yet another logging of the name Eddie Murray into the Major League books, but this one very special. Tonight, Eddie Murray joined the exclusive 3,000 hit club in baseball. It happened in Minneapolis. We take you there. No Indians or Twins fans at the moment. Just Eddie Murray fans. And in the sixth inning, Twins pitcher Mike Tromley served it up. Eddie Murray delivered the historic hit. A modest single, but a momentous feat. Eddie Murray became the 20th man in baseball history to collect 3,000 hits in his career. Joined Pete Rose as only two switch hitters now to reach that milestone. The last player to reach 3,000 was Dave Winfield. Tonight, there he was, number 31, teammate Dave Winfield, leading the line of congratulations, and the Indians won as well, 4-1. to one. Now, let's take you to Milwaukee, where the Yankees opened up a weekend set with the Brewers, and it was a good start for the visiting Yanks. Here in the name of Wade Boggs, top of the second, hits the safety to left. Here comes Dave Silvestri to the plate. Here's the throw. Not in time. Yankees had a 3-1 lead, but Melito Perez ran into big trouble. Joe Oliver slammed one to left field, headed out of the park, a three-run homer. Oliver has knocked in five runs. The Brewers lead 12-6, but the biggest problem is this. Perez left with a sore arm in the third. That's one thing the Yankees do not need, another pitcher going down. On the scoreboard, Detroit over Boston, 7-6. Toronto beat Baltimore. Kansas City shut out the White Sox. As for the Mets tonight, the Reds were coming. The Reds were coming, and so was the former Mets manager, Davey Johnson. His Reds, one of the top teams in the league right now, but they were, shall we say, bummed tonight. That's because the Mets came back from a 5-2 deficit. Todd Hundley got a hunk of hunk of burning bat on that one. Gone. Two-run home run. The Mets scored three in the sixth inning, and then Rico Bronia provided two more in the seventh with this long ball. Way long. Center field, 7-5. Mets on top. Reds made it 7-6 in the ninth, but John Franco put out the fire. Yes, three straight wins for the Mets for the first time this season. How about that? On the board, St. Louis took care of the Cubs. Florida all over the Expos. Philadelphia beat Atlanta and Pittsburgh over Houston in the ninth. 
Well, we're just about 35 minutes away from the first ever NBA lockout of its players. Of course, it's kind of like having a teacher strike in the summer. They don't play till the fall, but with no collective bargaining agreement, there will be no free agent or draft pick signings and no summer basketball leagues. Meanwhile, on this day, the day after the Knicks filed tampering charges against the Miami Heat in their hopes of landing Pat Riley, the Heat actually did ask permission of the Knicks to talk with the former Knicks head coach. The Knicks denied permission. Hey, are you hot? They were at Wimbledon today. 106 and a half degrees, the reading at courtside. The hottest day ever at the championships. Jared Palmer, hot, taking the first set of his match against two-time defending champ Pete Sampras, but then Sampras warmed up. He won 14 of the final 17 games, and he won the match. 4-6, 6-4, 6-1, 6-2. 6-2. No major upsets today. And finally, in golf. They're midway through the U.S. Senior Open at Congressional Country Club, Bethesda, Maryland. <laughs> there, Chichi Rodriguez found out he finally, he did make the cut. C. Now comes Tom Weisskopf, a 69 yesterday, 69 today. Good for a six under par total. A share of the lead with Tommy Aaron. C. And there was Bob Murphy, who joins a group of golfers just one shot back of the leaders. Check this out. He's no Chichi, but he has his own way. C. I'm Scott Clark. That's it for sports. Have a super weekend. <laughs> Planning to. Thank you, Scott, very much. All the moves, Scotty. Thanks. <laughs> well, Mother Nature could deliver some pre 4th of July fireworks this weekend. Sam Champion in a moment with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast. Stay with us. Eyewitness News. I'm Ted Koppel. Coming up on Nightline, they're 245 miles above us, circling at 17,000 miles an hour. We'll talk with the astronauts from space tonight. The all-important holiday forecast. Yeah, that's right. And it looks like we have a nice three out of four days anyway. Got a little problem with Saturday, but I think we'll get through that easily even. Take a look at the number. 70 degrees outside right now, relative humidity at 88 percent. The barometer's rising. Is an area of high pressure still with us, but it's about to pull off toward the Atlantic. South winds at eight miles per hour, pulling up some more moist and warm and humid air that we're going to have to deal with. And that means more clouds and showers for Saturday. 83 degrees, the warmest number of the day. 64 where we started earlier this morning. Let's just get it out of the way. Oh, oh well, by the way, we'll tell you right now, number 68 degrees LaGuardia, 67 out toward the end of the island. Now let's just get it right out of the way and we'll tell you what's going on the 4th of July. All across the nation, we plan to sketch things out for you just to show you where the sunny skies are. And I think we're lucky with this. This will probably last with us, the clearer skies once we pull into them Sunday, all the way th through the 4th of July. And even the fireworks will probably be in good shape. I would look for some haze in just kind of um, humid form, but I don't think we're going to have a lot of clouds or even thunder showers on Tuesday. I think we escape out of that. Satellite picture will show you that we've got some clouds off to the west now. So as these clouds move east, it is likely we will see some showers and thunder showers at any time tomorrow. But it is most likely these things will kick up tomorrow afternoon as all of this humidity that's down to the south here with the heavier clouds rushes east and rushes northeast at the same time this front is squeezing directly toward the eastern seaboard. That high, just think of the past starting tomorrow. It starts to move out of the way, but you'll notice these clouds and plenty of them tomorrow. I would say that there are a lot of clouds in the sky on Saturday. Sunshine does try to break through every now and then, but I think clouds are what you're going to see most of. 70 degrees, that's the way we start the morning. So it's warm right off the start. 62 to 67 out toward the end of the island, and inland numbers will take about 65 degrees. High temperature for the day on Saturday it seems to be nice and warm at 84 degrees, and it's even warmer than the normal 83, but it is not the nicest day of the weekend. I think we start to clear out. Sunday midday at some point you'll start to see the sunshine winning over the clouds but again tomorrow tomorrow's our problem before this cold front moves through there will be some clouds holding on to the first part of Sunday morning that's just as that front starts to move off Long Island 69 degrees mostly cloudy skies it's still humid in the morning it's a humid mix with a late thunder shower by 84 degrees tomorrow afternoon the rest of the five-day plan looks nice and so does your holiday weekend get it out of the way Sunday afternoon and everything's clear Monday beautiful even Tuesday though we have some what looks like clouds if it's mostly haze barbecue <laughs> get it out let's go Thanks. thank you Sam when we come back, going bananas over love. Ivan, the gorilla, shows off his sweethearts, or, yeah, sweethearts, next. One more. Looking ahead now to some of the stories we'll see tomorrow, July 1st. The lower house of the Russian parliament holds a no-confidence vote on the Boris Yeltsin government. President Clinton travels to Connecticut to kick off the Special Olympic Games. And New York City opens its 56 outdoor pools. Finally tonight, things may not be perfect for Ivan the gorilla, not yet anyway, but they certainly are looking up. 
Ivan spent his life in a cramped exhibit at a Seattle shopping mall. Now he has a new home at the zoo in Atlanta. He's loving his first outdoor experience. The problem, however, seems to be with Ivan's roommates, two female gorillas who want no part of Ivan. So I guess Ivan is not Ivan the lovable, is he? Maybe they're just not the gorilla of his dreams. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Couldn't resist. That's the news for us for right now. I'm Sarah Wallace. And Sarah, thank you for joining us. It's always a delight to have you here. Thanks, Steve. For Sarah and Sam, the entire Eyewitness News team, I'm Bill Butel. Thanks for being with us. Good luck. Be well. Good night. And of course, enjoy your holiday. <laughs> Scott wanted to say something special. <laughs> <laughs>